that's that's really Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time, a show that comes to you every Tuesday. Joining me on set is Shaka Sally himself, a.k.a. the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? I remain simple, easy, and awesome. Uh, with your incredibly looking, uh, uh, oh, gorgeous shirt. Guess who is talking? What about <laughs> you, man? <laughs> Okay, uh, today we'll be talking about a wider range of issues and uh, we'll, for the first time, uh, bring in a surprise uh, guest uh, who is going to interact uh, with us uh, on uh, Shaka Extra Time. Uh, but uh, before we go there, let's uh, maybe start in uh, Rwanda. Uh, something remarkable Shaka happened in Rwanda. Uh, they, for the first time, uh, in maybe in so long, they opened a, man a, a, a smartphone manufacturing plant in Rwanda. Uh, what uh, a remarkable achievement uh, on behalf of uh, Rwanda. I think uh, that Rwanda deserves to be congratulated for obviously, you know, coming up with that kind of effort because uh, the last time I checked, uh, up to now, there has not been a single country on the African country, I mean continent, uh, that was in fact manufacturing those types of things, those types of important gadgets. Uh, the only countries I know of uh, which have something to do with those types of gadgets, and that is simply assembling. You're probably talking about Algeria, you're talking about Egypt, you're talking about Ethiopia, and I think South Africa. Uh, but uh, there are people who also say that uh, what is happening in Rwanda is as more of assembling, not really manufacturing. Well, that is what they say, but you know, poor. I have often said that uh, when it comes to opinions, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But when it comes to facts, that one, you do not have different sets of different facts. They are facts. Well, and I think from the story that I was able to see, it makes a very significant difference between what they call manufacturing which apparently is happening in Rwanda, and uh, assembling, which I said uh, has actually uh, is going on uh, in Algeria, in Egypt, in Ethiopia, and I think South Africa. Uh, maybe I could also add that uh, in 2012, I covered a young man from uh, Congo Brazzaville by the names of Varon Manku, uh, who is arguably Africa's Steve Jobs, uh, who started a cell phone and tablet manufacturing company in Congo Brazzaville that, by the way, uh, it prog is programmed uh, in local languages, so it has access, it can be accessed by a lot of, a lot of uh, young people. But uh, maybe what is interesting in Rwanda is that they're actually making those phones for him. He couldn't keep up with uh, the demand, so he had to maybe solicit uh, uh, the expertise of Chinese I to see. help him. Yeah. But the other thing that uh, I think we should also really be very clear about, we are talking about uh, smartphones. Correct. Not simply or just phones? No, no, he was doing smartphones. smartphones. Yes, absolutely. Really? Yes, smartphones and smart uh, tablets. But it was like uh, a sort of individual effort from the way you have been able uh, so, no, no, I mean, since it. then he has raised enough money to actually go public because uh, when I talked to him in, two, in 2012, uh, that's how many years ago, mm. he had uh, at least, uh, when I talked to him, he had sold about 500,000 units. Mm. Mm? It's very interesting, by the way, that uh, the brain is behind this in Rwanda. The man uh, whose name I saw... Uh, Ashish Taka. Ashish Taka. I've interviewed him several be, times, yeah. Yeah, the last time I checked, I saw that uh, he was, in fact, uh, a Ugandan citizen. Is that true? Yes, absolutely correct. Which means that uh, he basically found, uh, uh, you know, environmentally and commercially friendly uh, environment... Uh, it was wonderful for him to do that because he could have actually done it uh, in Uganda, which even in terms of population, in terms of the numbers and what have you, say, 
Uh, Elijah Market. Yeah, he seems to have uh, uh, a softer uh, supporter uh, in uh, Rwanda. He, uh, he moved actually most of uh, his uh, uh, holdings, company holdings, uh, to uh, Dubai and uh, Rwanda. So I think uh, it's not surprising that uh, he decided to launch uh, that uh, manufacturing factory out there. So he probably got uh, what you would say a uh, friendly sort of incentives. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and uh, today, for the first time, I told you earlier that uh, we have a surprise guest. So we are going to go to uh, Mona in uh, Germany, who has been a long time a fan of uh, Shaka Extra Time. Mona, welcome to Shaka Extra Time. Hello, Shaka and Paul. Hello, how are you? And this is Mona. This is Mona Nambarewa from Dostan, German, North Rhine-Westfalen. Hello, Mona. Your show is Hello, it's so educative and inspiring. But I have a burning question with me. Go for it. Despite the fact that Africa is rich with every natural resource, why is it that most of the African population, we are below poverty line? It's a very interesting uh, question, Mona, and I think that um, actually you know, Paul and I have actually been um, asking that question, and um, we've also been asking that type of question on different editions of Straight Talk Africa. Because, uh, let's yeah, face it... It uh, bothers me a lot. Yeah. It bothers me a lot. I see we have a lot of natural resources, but our people are so poor. Well, is it possible that uh, we are probably talking about uh, a sort of... Uh, what would be characterized by people as uh, a leadership deficit. We definitely need uh, a sort of leadership that is visionary, just like uh, the founding fathers uh, in the 1950s and 60s uh, who helped us to end colonialism, as it were, so that African countries could regain political independence from the former European powers. So we probably, in this particular case, really need a legitimate, genuine, uh, you know, kind of like uh, a leadership, really, uh, a new bleed of African leaders who can lead the way and uh, liberate our people, because as you say, Mona, Africa, when you think about it uh, in, the in, in, the, in the context of resources, uh, it is probably the richest on this planet Earth. And yet when you look at uh, the quality of life of the African people on the continent, uh, they are pretty much uh, behind everyone else, really. The question is why? Uh, Shaka, let me do a quick uh, follow-up here. You talk about uh, leadership as uh, one of the key things that maybe we need on the continent, uh, but we are talking about uh, Rwanda. Uh, Kagame displays uh, a perfect example of leadership. He has championed his country as a tech hub for Africa. Would that be, uh, would, uh, to his credit, uh, a lot of people go to Rwanda, they're transferring uh, skills there, they're taking these tech uh, companies to Rwanda. So wouldn't that be part of uh, the solution that we are looking for? It would, but uh, we probably be talking about uh, what we would say uh, in terms of economics and development, a sort of sup superstructure. What is essentially needed is an infrastructure and I'm not simply talking about uh, roads or bridges and what have you, but I'm talking about uh, a democratic infrastructure, an idea that is, for example, inclusive, that does not leave anyone behind. And that uh, when you talk about that type of infrastructure, you are talking about uh, the one that has the ability uh, to rally people, to mobilize people, organize them in a disciplined manner, in a very smart manner, in a way that at the end of the day, 
you are able to deliver what is called social, economic, political justice for everybody. One of the reasons why, for example, the United States of America, one of the reasons why the experiment here succeeded in terms of making the United States, despite the fact that uh, it does not have the largest population on this planet Earth, and yet it boasts the single largest economy, mm. is largely because it is a nation that is built on the basis of ideas, ideas that work, not blood, not color, not religion, but ideas, ideas which are inclusive, ideas that do not leave ever anybody behind. The United States, I have to say, is not perfect, is not a perfect union. It has a lot of problems and what have you, but it has the ability, it has the social, economic, political shock absorbs that help it somehow figure out a way of making sure that it works. I hear people talk about how democracy is not suited for Africa, for example, because those, I, those those people say that uh, it is a European or a European-American mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, democracy does not belong to any particular geographical location. Mm -hmm. It does not belong to any particular racial group. It does not belong to any particular ideology or religion. It is a universal value. And I frankly do not see why we cannot, as Africans, borrow from those countries on this planet Earth that have figured it out and that it works for them. Look at the Scandinavian countries, for example. When you look at uh, the United Nations Human Development Index, you find that most countries that actually score very, very highly, they are from the Scandinavian countries. They are Norway, they are Denmark, they are Sweden. You know, those types of countries. And they provide one of the best quality of lives anywhere on the Earth planet. And it's not about blood, whether you have blue blood or red blood. Everybody has red blood. Yeah, L let me do a quick follow-up from uh, David Onserio Monda. Uh, he says, Shaka, you've uh, given uh, uh, President Kagame some credit uh, for bringing these uh, take uh, companies uh, to Rwanda. But uh, uh, one thing that uh, you haven't talked about is uh, how does Kagame negotiate a peaceful transition to democracy when a free, fair, and credible election would certainly hand over power to his minority? A very good question indeed, and uh, it's probably not as simple as it is, because if it was very simple to answer, I would like to think that by now it would have been not only been answered in Rwanda, but it probably would have also been answered in the neighboring countries of Uganda, of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we talk about the Democratic Republic of Congo when you talk about Africa being endowed with wealth, you're talking about the epicenter of wealth. But, but Democratic Republic of Congo just had a, a peaceful power, uh, power transfers. Well, unfortunately, uh, Paul, I'm not that uh, very optimistic, probably or as optimistic as you. The last time I checked, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo probably is only, at best, democratic in a name. But when you come to the manner in which that particular country is organized, it leaves a lot to be desired. But, when but you talk in, about fairness, in fairness to the, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you can't compare it uh, with uh, uh, Uganda or Rwanda, for example. At least for them, they have set a precedent. They have said, you know what, we've had enough, and it's about time the president, the incumbent president, handed over power to an opposition leader. We give them credit, I yeah. think, uh, where, it, you know, where it is deserved. I think they have done that, uh, except that uh, someone will come and tell you, yes, 
Did they have, in fact, an election? Yes, they did have an election. But there are people who say, actually, that that election did not meet what you would call the international democratic threshold. Mm. That, in fact, that election uh, is a type of uh, process that, at the end of the day, delivered a Felix Kisekedi as the president. Mm. But some people say, when you look at that presidency of Felix Kisekedi, he looks like a man who has a rank, who has a position, but does not seem to have the authority to make things move. Uh, let's go back to Germany, to our surprise guest in uh, Germany. Uh, Mona, you live uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, you are in a country that uh, is arguably the largest economy uh, in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, what do yeah. Africans make of, uh, or Africans in the diaspora there, what do they make of uh, the African politics that we are talking about? Mm, largely, most of them. Uh, now, for instance, for my country, Uganda, where I come from, most of the people in the diaspora are so much into politics. Every day they hear what is going on in Uganda, and they don't feel at ease, but really they, they always ask, Will there ever be free and fair elections in Africa? You were talking on, on elections, but really, does fair, free and fair election in Africa exist? If we see also in connection with, for instance, countries which are developed like America, there is, there are not free and fair elections. What does it, uh, how does it affect Africa as a whole? If we see what is going on right now in America and what is going on with Africa, what lessons do we draw from that? Shaka, that's a very interesting uh, take. Yeah, Mona, I think that, uh, frankly, it probably would not be fair to say uh, when you talk about uh, elections not being free, fair, transparent, uh, and uh, credible, I don't think it would be fair to talk about Africa in general, because there are certain specific situations where elections in some African countries meet that type of threshold. South Africa, for example. South Africa is definitely the beacon of hope for African democracy so far. And in fact, when you look at uh, Southern Africa, the Southern Africa part of the continent, it probably is in the lead in terms of uh, what appears to be democratic governance. You're talking about Botswana. You're talking about uh, Mauritius. You're talking about uh, Namibia. You're talking about uh, really countries that uh, have tried. But let's face it, they are still in the process because democracy, in fact, the last time I checked, is a work in progress. Even right here in the United States, we do have a debate about what happened in 2016. We seem not to have figured it out yet. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, the, you know, democracy, I think that uh, African leaders should embrace democracy. Because I sometimes wonder why anybody should be asking whether or not democracy is the right medicine for Africa. And yet, it seems to be working in the, you know, the other countries in the world. Like I was talking about uh, the Scandinavian countries. They embrace a sort of democratic system that delivers goods for everybody to be a decent, respected human being. You have, for example, education there. Education there is a right, not a privilege. You have uh, uh, the situation of medical care. When somebody is sick, it is a right, not a privilege. And so I think it can be done. And when you talk about Africans talking about uh, ideas which come from somewhere else, for example, I was looking at electricity. When you look at electricity, 
nobody bothers, you know, in Kavari where the electric bulb uh, first came from. Nobody even asks the question about a man called Thomas Edison, mm. whether Thomas Edison is a Tutsi, a Hutu, whether Thomas Edison is uh, uh, a Kakwa, a Kikuyu, or a Jaruo, whether Thomas Edison is an Igbo, or Yoruba, or an American, or a European. But what is important is what Thomas Edison contributed. When you, when you switch on a light, the light is not going to ask you which tribe or ethnic community you come from. And you talk about uh, telephones, for example. Yeah. We're talking about telephone. I, a I wanted to do a quick follow Alexander, yeah. Alexander Graham Bell, a man who was Scottish, migrated to Canada, subsequently to the United States of America, and invented the telephone. In fact, he's buried in Auburn in New York, upstate New York, where I went for undergraduate school. Yeah, Shaka, let's do a quick follow-up on the same topic. Let's go to Ghana. Let's go to uh, Asha Jackson uh, in Accra, Ghana. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, you are talking about uh, America ha not having free, fair elections, but we've done it in Ghana. Ghana has had free, fair elections. Why are you not mentioning Ghana? Well, I, I, by the way, I was not mentioning every country, but if I were to come to West Africa, I would definitely have mentioned Ghana. Ghana is not only a pioneer in terms of uh, the indigenous African countries being uh, regaining political independence, you know, beginning March 6, 1957, in Accra, under the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. But now that Ghana has a democracy, I would, I would like that Ghana should challenge itself in the same way that Nkrumah challenged the people of Ghana at the time, that the independence of Ghana would be meaningless unless it was linked with the total liberation of the African continent. And Nkrumah did not simply talk the talk. He actually walked the talk so that the rest of Africa could actually walk the walk. Now I can challenge Ghana to challenge itself and its people that the democracy of Ghana would be meaningless unless it is linked with the democratization process of the entire African continent. Uh, Bona, uh, let's uh, get uh, back to you. Do you, st uh, you want to ask Shaka one more question? Now uh, you're one of those uh, fans who, has, uh, who is always uh, like very active actively engaged so with one, this one show. One more time. I was following Sudan of recently, in September, before it ended. They were supposed to make, to form a unitary government, but unfortunately, the opposition leader, Riyak Mashar, rejected to it. Where do you, where do you think Sudan will end up to if they cannot South Sudan. have a, a government? Yes, I think that uh, um, I agree with uh, Paul that uh, you, are pr you are probably talking about uh, South Sudan, not yeah, South not Sudan. Sudan. Riyak not... Machal and Salva Kiri, they have rejected the the pact to have a, a unitary government. Where do you see Sudan after all these years? Will they ever have peace? At the end of the day. Uh, it's really uh, a matter of time, I think, that uh, the only answer, the only solution for the people of South Sudan, just like the people of the entire African continent, it is democracy. It is going to have to be a system that is inclusive, a system that, in a sense, is really, at the end of the day, a system that reflects social, economic, political justice for everybody. Until and unless that happens, I don't think, frankly, that we can talk about uh, the African continent or South Sudan, for that matter, you know, being developed, you know, be developing. And it can be done. It's simply a question of having the right leadership. We have a leadership deficit. And part of the reason we do that is because we have yet 
to come up with a system that allows the people to be the primary stakeholders in terms of the affairs of their societies so that they can actually have a system that can give them an opportunity to choose who they think should be their leader. Not having leaders who impose themselves upon their people. In fact, I sometimes wonder, Paul, why we call even some of these people, you know, leaders. These are people who are busy stealing elections, for example. Mm -hmm. When you steal an election, you have stolen a country. You use a country, for example, to actually demand for loans from the Bretton Woods institutions. We're talking about the International Monetary Fund, mm. the World Bank, the ADB, and you name it. And where does that money go? That money, for the most part, does not go to help the real people. It only goes to help a very small group of people who reflect when they talk about democracy Mm. A government of some people, by some people, for some people. But in fact, what is needed is the definition of democracy according to a one great American president, Abraham Lincoln. By the people and for the people. And so we should have a situation where the people call the shots, not these individuals who call them leaders. In fact, these individuals, they are either imposters. If not imposters, they are rulers. Because if you are a leader, concerns of your people, and you can only do it if you consult them. Shaka, we are almost uh, running out of time. What are you talking about uh, tomorrow in Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow, it's very interesting. We are talking with uh, uh, a lady who comes from uh, the great uh, tra rich traditions of the Ashanti kingdom, a prince, Nana Konadu Ajekum Rawlings someone that uh, served as uh, the first lady of her country uh, for many, many, many years. She's the longest serving uh, first lady in the history of Ghana. She is an incredible lady. Uh, and uh, she has written a great book uh, called uh, uh, it, takes a woman. it Takes a Woman, which stresses essentially her journey through life. And uh, we'll be talking about that and many other things tomorrow. Tune in. Uh, interesting. Uh, on that uh, note, uh, thank you to uh, our guest uh, in uh, Germany. Mona, thank you so much. I will look forward to hosting you on another edition of Shaka Extra Time. And to you here in the studio, thank you so much uh, for uh, your insight. And I look forward to hosting you on another edition of Shaka Extra Time. Thank you, Ndugu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.